Hi, I'm Babette Reeves, and just going to share with you today a brief presentation about um, some of what goes on in our brains and nervous system uh, and in our body when we do experience anxiety. And this information then makes it easier to understand why um, certain things are recommended to help and work with anxiety. They just make more sense. And I find that for the people I work with, um, then it makes them easier to commit to the, to the little bit of work that's necessary in order to um, manage anxiety. So basically today we're gonna talk about the brain. This is fairly simplified, but at the same time, it's, it's accurate. Um, and I'll list some sources at the end so you can see where I've pulled this information from. Um, so this is a brain thing when we're talking about anxiety. And to talk about the brain, I'm gonna first look at the three main jobs that it does, okay? And I'm gonna draw three circles to represent these three big jobs. And this first circle, is where we have, and I usually point to the front of my uh, head, this is where thinking happens. So if you're at the store counting out change, if you're trying to decide what to have for dinner, um, you're evaluating, do I want to watch this or this, buy this or this, if you're forming an opinion, uh, reading a textbook, watching a documentary on TV. This is the part of the brain that's in high gear. It's doing all the hard work at that moment. When it does its work, it's very, very verbal. It uses lots of words um, to do its work, and it's pretty slow. Now, this middle part of the brain is where emotion and memory takes place. So when you're feeling something or remembering something, this is the part of the brain that's in high gear. It's also very verbal, uses lots of words to do its work, and it's also slow. This back part of the brain, and it's on the back side of your head, um, this back part of the brain, its job is keeping us alive. Uh, so I call it survival brain. Its um, job is no matter what's going on, normal day-to-day -day stuff or something a little out of the ordinary, its job is to keep us alive. As I just kind of hinted at, it keeps us alive two, primarily two different ways. The first is what I call the normal 24-7, day-in, day-out stuff that it just does all the time. It manages our breathing. We've been, you've been sitting here for five minutes or so, and not once have you probably had to say, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Your survival brain has just done it for you, okay? It also manages our heart rate, our blood pressure, blood pH, body temperature. Again, lots of things that keep us alive and that we need to have well managed 24 seven. It also manages our digestion. I just finished lunch and I did not have to tell my stomach to start digesting my lunch and I couldn't make it stop if I wanted to. It just does it automatically. So as you can see, the things that this part of the brain, the survival brain manages, they're pretty automatic. It just does them. This part of the brain is nonverbal. This is really important to remember. It basically does not use words to do its work and it does not understand words, okay? And it is also very, very, very super fast, okay? Now, the other way that it keeps us alive 
is if it perceives a threat. Okay, now I'm very, very careful, and it's a good thing for you to practice as well. I'm very careful to say perceives a threat. This part of the brain, remember, does not think. It doesn't think there's a threat. Thinking happens up here. This part of the brain, survival brain, perceives threats. And when it perceives something, it has us act sometimes. Okay, so it's all in charge of perceiving an action. All right, so if it perceives a threat, I'm sitting here in my office, I've got a door over there, I've got a window behind me, and if I open that door and there's a tiger there, my survival brain pretty sure is going to perceive a threat. And it's going to direct the glands in my body to start pumping out their chemicals, hormones. They're just chemicals. And for those chemicals to get to the parts of the body where they need to make something happen, they get transported in the bloodstream. So this happens, I see a tiger at my door, survival brain perceives a threat, and then very automatically, very quickly, these chemicals go whooshing through my bloodstream, through my body, and my breathing's gonna change. It's going to get fast and shallow. My heart rate's gonna tick up because my body's trying to get more oxygen in and get it to my muscles that have gotten tense. And by the way, a set of chemicals have also shut down my digestion because if the tiger eats me, it won't matter whether or not I digested my lunch. But heart rate's up, blood um, breathing's up, fast and shallow, muscles are tense, and all of that is getting my body ready to either fight the tiger, run away from the tiger, or freeze and play dead. We call those defense responses, okay? Fight, flee, or freeze. So let's say my survival brain does all that, gets me ready, I jump out the window, I run to the other end of the street. So I have this ramp up, I flee, and when I get to the other end of the street and I'm safe, that ramp up comes back down, okay? It's a pretty flexible system of up and down, okay? When there's a threat, our bodies ramp up, to prepare ourselves to fight, flee, or freeze. When we're safe again, the system ramps back down, okay? Except sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the system gets a little sticky, okay? And I think of it as a dimmer switch, okay? Um, and if you've ever had a dimmer switch on a light that kind of got a little dirt or rust or whatever inside of it, it just doesn't move real smoothly anymore, okay? And this is what this ramp up, ramp down system can get like sometimes. And when that happens, the system can wind up staying kind of up there at the top most of the time. Okay, or a lot of the time, or it doesn't come back down to baseline like it would if it was flexible. Okay, don't have to worry too much about why this happens. Okay, um, what's important is to understand that the system can lose its flexibility sometime. Okay, so why is this important? Well, let's say I get up at 5 30 in the morning and that's when I usually get up, go get ready for work. I go in, first thing I do is pour a cup of coffee and let's say I spill my cup of coffee. First thing there in the morning, I am going to be ticked. That is not the way I wanna start my day, okay? And I'm gonna have a little, and you'll see that little arrow that's going up a little bit. I'm gonna have a little uptick in the system, all right? But, I also know it's just a cup of coffee. I mop it up, pour myself another cup, go sit down, read the newspaper. But let's say 
I am hanging out up here at the top. My system is. Okay. I go in and I pour my coffee and I spill it. And same amount of uptick there, but because my system is kind of up there at the top, it's going to react way more. I am going to cuss. I am going to throw my coffee mug down in the sink. I'm going to stomp around and have a bit of a hissy fit um, because I spilled my coffee. And later, I'm probably going to look back and go, what was that about? Why did I overreact so much? Well, it's because my system is hanging out there at the top. So when it has a little uptick and you're already at the top, it goes over the top or out the window is usually how we refer to it. Um, doesn't happen to everybody, but if you're a person that's like your anxiety makes you really super irritable, if you find yourself flying off the handle, if you find yourself just very quickly getting way distressed, anxious, worried about something, um, it may be because your system's hanging a little closer to the top there. So one other thing that happens when survival brain goes into high alert, first let me say, let me give you three, I, I mean four, I tend to think of the survival brain kind of having levels. It doesn't just go from zero to 60 with nothing in between, okay? It has what I call threat levels, all right? So if you're just hanging out and everything is chill, you get kind of down at green level. And let's say you hear a crash, something crash at the other end of the house. Your survival brain is going to have you orient towards that crash. You may not even be aware of it. It may be just a slight movement of your head. Your eyes might shift in that direction. Again, you might not even really be aware that your body and your system is doing it. But your system has moved up from green up to yellow now. Okay. Let's say, though, after that crash, you hear somebody yell. Now your system's bumped up to orange. Okay. And then if you hear a door slam and a car goes squealing off, you're probably at red, leaving the room, going to find out what's happening. Yeah. Now, when survival brain hits orange or red level, sort of that uh, really high alert, full on alert for danger and threat, it does something interesting in that it takes the front two, these two parts of your brain offline. Think of a computer network, okay? And it's just like those two computer terminals just get turned off. They're taken out of the system. Survival brain is in charge. And this is why when our anxiety is really high, why it's difficult to think, make decisions, feel real fuzzy or foggy headed. Um, it's because that part of the brain is not fully online. It's why we often, after anxiety or during it, we have a hard time remembering things, okay? Because this part of the brain is offline and it's not retrieving or encoding memories properly as it usually would because it's offline. Now, why would survival brain do this, okay? It only does it if it increases our chances of survival because that's its job. So let's go back to our tiger. If I open my door and the tiger's there, and if this thinking part of the brain takes charge, it's probably going to say, hey, yeah, that's a tiger. But I wonder if the tiger, maybe if the tiger's not hungry, it won't eat me. Maybe if it's tame, it won't eat me. Eat too slow. By then, I'm dead meat. If it's the middle part of the brain that takes charge, emotion and memory, it's going to be, ooh, I love kitties. I used to have a kitty. Hmm? Again, too slow. I'm dead. So millennia ago, 
survival brain figured out that these two parts of the brain are too slow. Let's get them out of the way until we get safe again. The other image sometimes that we can use for survival brain when this getting sticky or kind of stuck, losing that flexibility happens, is also a little bit like malfunctioning smoke detector. Okay, properly functioning smoke detector is supposed to pick up smoke so we can get out of the house, right? But we've all had the situation where we just have a little bit of smoke in the kitchen, we just burn something a little bit, a little burned piece of toast, and then the next thing you know, the smoke detector's going off. And what do we all do? Everything comes to a screeching halt. You can't get anything done while that thing's going off. And we're in there waving dish towels at it and puffing at it. And if we can't get it to shut up, what do we all do? We rip the battery out and it gets really quiet. Okay. But you put the battery back in and if there's still smoke there, it's still going to be screaming again. All right. This is, can be one of the problems with some medications for treating anxiety. It's a big reason why tr the, the best practice, the go-to treatments for anxiety are what we call, the big fancy word is non-pharmacological, non-medication. Now again, this is not medical advice, this is information. Talk to your doctor. Okay, um, but some medications like benzodiazepines, yeah, they'll rip that battery out of the screaming anxiety alarm. They rip the battery out, it gets real quiet, it's nice, but four to six hours later when it wears off, battery slams back in, the noise starts up again, and now this front part of the brain starts getting anxious about why is that happening again and whatever you did, I want you to do it again. And, and, and where's that pill? Where's that pill? Where's that pill? So they can actually increase anxiety um, pretty easily. Every medication has an appropriate use. So I'm not saying nobody should ever be taking a benzo. Um, but understanding a bit more even in a simplistic way of how they work and how they can make the problem worse, or it's also part of why they can become so addictive, it's important for all of us to know. Um, just like we all know about the side effects of prednisone, um, it's a, a benefit, weighing benefits against risk, and when the benefits outweigh the risk, yeah, we choose to use that medication. When the risks are outweighing the benefits, um, you know, we're talking to our doctors, our doctors are talking to us, and we're reevaluating. I share that mostly so that you understand when you have a doctor or a therapist say, no, I'm not prescribing something, and I'm not prescribing a benzo for anxiety, you understand where they're coming from. It'll help you be able to ask questions have some more discussion with them. But that's basically where they're coming from. Those are the risks that they're worried about. Now, let me explain one other uh, little concept that can be helpful. And what we've been talking about with this system that goes up and comes back down, that's pretty flexible, and that does all these automatic things, this is happening in the part of the nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. Um, it's, you can kind of, it's not real scientific, but you can kind of substitute the word automatic. I mean, this system is the one that handles most of the things that go on automatically in our body, okay? And in our autonomic nervous system, let's take um, pulse, okay, your pulse rate. It goes, look at the blue line, it goes up and down all the time. You know, if you take your pulse every 15 minutes, it's, you know, if at one time it's 71, the next time it may be 69, the next time it may be 70, it's, it's going to be going up and down all the time, okay? 
and your system is always regulating it towards that dashed line, that midpoint. It's always trying to keep it centered on that midpoint. If it goes too low, it's going to bring it back up. If it goes too high, it's going to bring it back down towards that midline. Now, if the system gets sticky and stays sticky for a long time, and no, I can't tell you how long is a long time, okay? But we're talking, we're talking probably for most people, you know, number of months or years, okay? But if it stays in the red line, which is dysregulated, that's that sticky inflexibleness, okay? If it stays in that for a long time, okay, one of the things that can happen is that the nervous system becomes more sensitive. It becomes sensitized. That's where it starts hanging out up at the top more, and it's where you can start picking up every little thing that's going on inside your body because your nervous system has got more sensitive. It's not, like, it's not that all of a sudden there's a problem with your heart just because you can feel it beating more or you can feel these up and down changes more is the fact that your nervous system has gotten more sensitive. So it's picking it up more than it used to. It's actually called central sensitization. Okay. It's important to know if you're dealing with, if you've been dealing with anxiety for a while, okay, because you're going to have to work with this, okay, to understanding that just because something comes on quickly or just because you feel something you've never felt before in your body, it doesn't mean there's a problem. It doesn't mean that our illness has picked up some new bloody wrinkle. It doesn't mean we're getting ready to die. It's, it's just that our nervous system is more sensitive. We're picking up more signals more often than what we used to. So how do we work with anxiety? I'm not really going to get into it here. I'll just throw out some more touch point tips over the weeks. Um, but here's the basic idea, okay? If your system is hanging out kind of high, then you've got a lot of smoke detector noise going on a lot of the time. And so what we do is we work to bring that system down, bring that ramp up down, start sliding things down that arrow and start quieting that smoke detector, okay? We start retraining as we do that. What we're doing is we're retraining your survival brain Okay, right now with it hanging kind of high, it is, here's a definition of anxiety to hang on to. And interfering anxiety is when your survival brain is perceiving threat when you're actually safe. I'm going to repeat that because it's really important. Interfering anxiety is when your survival brain is picking up threat, perceiving threat, when you are actually safe, okay? And that can be retrained. We can train survival brain that you are actually safe when you are safe. We're not gonna retrain it to, to think that you're safe when there's a tiger at the door. That's why we never get rid of anxiety, okay? But it does get pretty interfering when that alarm is going off all the time when you're sitting and petting your cat, okay? That's annoying and that feels miserable in our bodies as well. So we can retrain that. And once that system settles down, okay, once this body nervous system settles down, then it's easier to start working with the thoughts and emotions that can fuel anxiety and keep it going. Okay, so let me give you one brief example, okay? If you've ever talked probably to your doctor, maybe your partner has even said this, a therapist, somewhere along the way when you've talked about your anxiety or you've been having sort of an anxiety attack, somebody has probably told you to breathe, okay? And 
or they've tried to talk you into calming down. Okay. Because you know this is coming from survival brain and survival brain is nonverbal, you understand now why they can't talk you down out of the tree and you can't talk yourself down out of the tree. It doesn't understand words. It does not understand words. Okay? But that's where we're trying to communicate with it verbally. We need to communicate with it non-verbally. How do we do non-verbal communication? Well, survival brain works with the body. If you notice, one of the first things I talked about was how it works with breathing and manages breathing. We can use our breathing to communicate non-verbally with survival brain that you are safe. And this is just one example. All the techniques for working with and retraining survival brain all work on this same principle of using the body to communicate non-verbally with survival brain that you are safe. So let's take a look at breathing real fast. I told you that when things ramp up, your breathing gets fast and shallow, okay? I can bring in a group of people. This has been done in experiments. You bring in a group of people. They've never had a problem with anxiety before. They're all chill. They're great. You sit them down, tell them to breathe fast and shallow for about 20 minutes, and guess what? They start feeling anxious. It works because fast and shallow breathing are what happens when we're under threat, okay? Fast and shallow breathing goes with threat. When, I, when my survival brain perceives that tiger, my breathing changes to fast and shallow. Now, if I wanna use my breathing to communicate safety, which is the opposite of threat, what can I do with my breathing? What's the opposite? Slow and deep. If I do slow and deep breathing, my survival brain gets the nonverbal message that I am safe. And it gets it every time. And here's why. Think about if I'm going to run away or fight that tiger. Can I breathe slowly and deeply while fighting or running? No, it's just physically impossible, okay? So this is just biology. We're using our biology for our advantage, all right? Slow, deep breathing will always communicate verbally that you are safe. And each time that you do it, that ramp up comes down just a little bit. I'm talking three or four deep breaths. I'm talking 10, 15 seconds. It will still bring it down a little bit. Practice more than that. It starts retraining more than that. You cannot do deep breathing too much. Okay. Now, we have weird bodies. Check with your doctor, your pulmonologist, especially if you have anything going on um, with your lungs and breathing. But in general, this is safe no side effects, all natural. Um, and every time you do deep breathing, it slows things down and communicates safety. And it starts to retrain the brain. As I said, here's a couple of uh, sources. Um, the first book, it's, it's a fabulous book. Uh, it's about 200 pages. It's pretty dense. It is not Bessel van der Kolk's book. His book is The Body Keeps the Score. Often these two get confused. Um, the second one is, I just feel like public health wise, everybody should read uh, the next one. It's about a three page um, article that's a transcription of a speech that Dr. Felitti gave. This is one of the, um, the pivotal research studies of the 20th century. Um, and that an awful lot of work has spun off from um, in the 20 years since. And then the last one is another one that's just fascinating about um, how some of this can, I said we don't really worry about the causes of anxiety too much, but this one kind of gives you some information if you're just really curious about that one. Um, I don't have the link there, but you can just, you can just Google it and it'll pop right up. All right. Um, again, 
keep an eye on postings that I'll do, um, the touch points for better health, and I will be, you know, throwing out some more tips that are going to build off of this information over time. Um, because I, as I said earlier, we usually do best with anxiety when we work with this nervous system and body part first, um, before we start working with the thinking and emotions. And now you know why. It's because if our anxiety is too high, survival brain is taking over, thinking and emotions have shut down, and we can't work with them at that point. So working with this body piece first, this nervous system piece first, is usually very, very um, helpful um, with managing anxiety. So look forward to your, your comments and, and chats on those postings, and thanks for listening.